One of the misunderstandings that people have about the Christian life is that once you become a Christian, your life is pretty easy and everything goes pretty well. That's just not true. I don't even know where that expe expectation comes from because the Bible doesn't say that. In fact, it says just the opposite. Jesus warned his disciples that in this world they would have trouble, that there would be people who hated them, persecuted them, that they would have enemies. Not only that, but if you go back to the Old Testament and read the story of Job, Job was a faithful man, a godly man, and he just didn't understand why he was suffering so much when he had been so faithful. The book of Psalms reflect over and over and over again the hardship, the pain, the unanswered questions that God's people often experience, as well as the blessings and joys that come with belonging to God. It's important that we understand this, that we understand that belonging to God Having a relationship with God, being a child of God, does not mean that nothing bad is going to happen, that our lives are going to be easy. It's important that we understand that that's not the case, so that we are not taken by surprise when bad things happen to faithful people. When those seasons of darkness or hardship or loss come, we might be tempted to think, if Jesus was right here, right now, maybe I could get some answers to why this is happening. And surely he could prevent these things for us. The story of Jesus and Lazarus that we're going to look at this morning in John 11 is a powerful and poignant story. It has a triumphant ending, but it is a story that is also full of pain. It has a lot to say to us, I think, about what we can and can't expect when we go through our own seasons of hardship, times of loss, difficulty, unanswered questions. Two ways in particular I think this story connects with our own lives, but also shows us what God has planned to do about it. So the first thing I want us to think about as we look together at John chapter 11, verses 1 to 44, is this. Think about this story in relation to those times in your life when it feels like God doesn't care. You ever had a season like that? Where it felt like God didn't care. When you read the story of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, one of the impressions that kind of hangs over the story and, and fills the first part of the story is that Mary and Martha, I think, very likely felt like Jesus didn't really care about them. At least not like they thought he did. And the reason why I think that must have been part of what Mary and Martha experienced is because of a few things that the story tells us, uh, beginning right here in the first few verses. It, said, it tells us in verse 1 that Lazarus was ill. Lazarus was the brother of Mary and Martha. They lived in a village called Bethany. And when he was ill, verse 3 says, So the sisters sent to him, sent to Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. That indicates that Jesus had a special relationship with Lazarus and Mary and Martha. In fact, it tells us as much later in verse 5. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, that's Mary, and Lazarus. Not just like Jesus loved everybody, right? But in some special and significant way, Jesus loved Mary and Lazarus 
and Martha. They were his friends. He knew them. A stranger could walk up to Jesus and know that Jesus loved them. But Mary, or but Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus as you love dear friends whom you know and spend time with and have developed a relationship with. Mary and Martha and Lazarus likely had seen Jesus do all kinds of amazing things. They'd probably seen him heal the sick. Maybe even they were there when he restored sight to the blind. And so when Lazarus falls ill, they do exactly what we would expect them to do. We've got a friend who can fix this. We are close to Jesus. And this stuff is no problem for Jesus. We've seen him heal people like this over and over and over probably. And so they send a message to Jesus. Lord, the one you love is ill. I doubt they even wondered if Jesus would come. I imagine they were confident that he would. But love does strange things sometimes. It's very strange to us what Jesus does. Jesus says in verse 4, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And then it says, verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, as we've seen. Then verse 6 says, So, so, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. That is strange. Jesus loved them, so he did not come to them when Lazarus was ill. That's not what anybody would have expected. I can't imagine that that's what Mary and Martha expected. I I have a hard time imagining they even dreamed Jesus would respond like that. I I doubt that that was even in the back of their mind that he would choose not to come. But he didn't come because he loved them. Now, to help us get our minds around what is going on here, think about this. Are there times when parents do things for their children out of love that their children do not understand? Why are you making that decision, Mom? Why are you refusing to let me do that, Dad? I don't understand. And Mom or Dad says, it's because I love you. And the kid says, that doesn't even make any sense. I I feel like if you love me, you would let me do this. Or you would respond in this different way. Now, if, if children cannot always understand the love behind their parents' actions. How much more so should we expect that we can't always understand the love behind God's actions? He may act in ways that make it feel like he does not love us, make it feel like he doesn't care. But what that really just means is that we don't understand what he's doing. It doesn't mean he doesn't care. It doesn't mean he doesn't love us. He's just doing something we didn't expect. His ways are higher than our ways, the Bible says. Love does strange things. But Jesus does this because he loves them, and he can respond this way in love because he knows the plan. When he says in verse 4 that this illness does not lead to death, he's not wrong. Because Lazarus does die. Jesus didn't get that wrong. Oh man, if I'd known he was going to die, I would have gone. That's not what he's saying. 
Jesus knows that the end of this story is not death. Not that Lazarus won't die. He knows Lazarus is not going to stay dead. That's why he says this illness is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. He has a plan to show something, to reveal something, to make something known through Lazarus' illness and death. But Mary and Martha don't know that. The disciples don't even know that. Jesus knows that. And that's why he acts the way that he does. But because Mary and Martha don't know this, when they see Jesus, they ask the question that you know had to be on their minds every day, maybe every hour from the moment they realized that Jesus was not coming in time to heal Lazarus. In verse 21, Jesus has come near to where they are and Martha comes out to Jesus outside the village and verse 21 says, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Is she wrong? She's not wrong. So behind that question has to be Martha asking, why weren't you here? You have dropped what you were doing to help people you have never met. And my brother, who was your friend, was sick and dying, and you didn't even come. But if you had, he wouldn't have died. But because you weren't here, he's in the tomb. That had to be what she was thinking. Verse 32, Mary says the same thing. It says, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. But I imagine that in these moments, it didn't feel like it. But love doesn't always do what we expect, especially when that love comes from God. But our lack of understanding does not mean there's a lack of love on God's part. Heart. We have to believe that He loves us, that He has a plan, even when we don't know what that plan is, and even when His actions or seeming inactions don't feel like He loves us. What about? when you do still know in your bones, in your soul, you know God cares. You know He loves you. But still, you wonder why He lets certain things happen or why He fails to do certain things. When Mary speaks to Jesus and says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. The next thing she says in verse 22 is, but even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Now, I don't know what Martha is thinking Jesus might ask that God might do. She's certainly not counting on Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. We can tell that from how she responds to what Jesus is going to say in just a moment. Maybe, maybe she herself didn't know what that hope was that she had sort of in the, the back of her mind and in the depths of her heart, but she still believed 
that Jesus was who she had always believed he was. She still believed that Jesus could do something. She still believed that Jesus could pray and God would hear and God would answer. And Jesus tells her when she says that, he tells her in verse 23, your brother will rise again. And she says, yeah, 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 I know. I know he will. Verse 24, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. See, the the hope of resurrection is not new with the resurrection of Jesus. The hope of the resurrection is taught in the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel talks about how at the end that those who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame and contempt. Job speaks about the resurrection. Psalm 16 speaks about resurrection. So the resurrection is taught in the Old Testament. And Mary knew that one day Lazarus would rise again. Because that's what the scriptures taught. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus has a nearer plan for for Lazarus to rise again. When she says, yeah, I I know, I know he's going to rise again on the last day. Jesus says in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the resurrection and the life. The resurrection is not just an event that you are waiting for. The resurrection is me. I'm the one who brings resurrection. I'm the one who gives resurrection. I'm the one who has life in himself and can give life to whoever I choose. Not only that, but he says, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Well, that makes sense if you believe in the resurrection, right? If someone dies, they'll live again because Jesus will raise them from the dead. But then he goes on to say in verse 26, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. What does that mean? Does that mean Lazarus didn't believe? No, it means that for those who believe in Jesus, even death is not really death. Even death is not the end. Even death ushers us into life in the presence of God. He he asks her, after he says that, do you believe this? And she makes a great confession. Peter's confession is famous. Like when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Mary's confession is no less robust and true than Peter's. She said to him, verse 27 says, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. She knows who Jesus is. She believes that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior. But just like Peter didn't fully understand what he was confessing, Mary didn't fully understand what she was confessing either. Jesus, after talking to Mary, speaks to Martha. And when she says to him, as we saw in verse 32, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Then verse 33 says, when Jesus saw her weeping, And the Jews who had come with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. It looked like Jesus didn't care. But obviously he did. Obviously he did. He weeps with those Who weep? Verse 36, right? The shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. He weeps with those who weep, as the Bible calls us to do, to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. He showed his love and concern and compassion for them by weeping 
with them. He was moved with them. And yet, that same question hung over his actions. Verse 36 and 37. When he wept, it says, so the Jews said, see how he loved him. They're reading his response and say, see, Jesus loved Lazarus. But verse 37 says, but some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Yes, it looks like he loved him, but couldn't he have done done something else besides show up and weep after he died? I mean, he healed a man who was born blind. Surely he could have done something for Lazarus. Jesus' love is evident. And yet that love did not prevent Lazarus' death. There may be times in our own lives where we know deep down that God loves us and yet we still wonder, God, why did you let that thing happen? Why did you not stop that? Why did you not answer that prayer that I prayed over and over and over? It may be some terrible tragedy that happens in your life. It may be a straying child or grandchild. It may be losing a job. It may be losing a loved one. It may be a family falling apart. Whatever it is. It's normal to wonder, God, why? Why didn't you do something different? Why did you let this happen? God simply does not give us all the answers. Over and over in the Bible, we find God's people asking, How long, O Lord? Because God doesn't tell us when these things are going to come to an end. He tells us they will, but He doesn't tell us when. So, what did Jesus have planned? that made him stay and wait until after Lazarus was dead before he came to Mary and Martha and came to Lazarus' tomb. Well, he told the disciples back in verse 15 when he knew that Lazarus had died because he's Jesus, right? He just he knows. He knew Lazarus had died. And so he tells them, verse 14, Lazarus has died. And then verse 15, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. If I had been there, there's something that it would have been hard for you to believe that now it won't be hard for you to believe because I wasn't there. He doesn't tell them what it is. Right, we know what it is because we've read the end of the story. But they didn't, he doesn't tell them what it is. But he wants them and wants us to believe something, right? When he says to Mary, I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? He's doing what he's doing. He's saying what he's saying because he wants us to believe something. Verse 40 and 42, it says, Jesus said to her, this is after he's told somebody to open the tomb. And and one of the sisters says, that's not a good idea. He's been in there way too long. This is not going to be good. Don't do that. He says, verse 40, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. Everything Jesus is doing is to establish faith in him, in the hearts of those who are going to witness what he's about to do. It was more loving for Jesus to let Lazarus die 
and then raise him from the dead so that many would believe. It was more loving for him to do that, evidently, than for him to spare Lazarus' life to heal him in the first place. Even knowing that, we might not be able to get our minds completely around that. But that's what happened. That's what Jesus did. That's what he was up to. So verse 43 says, When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And he did. Walked out on his own, alive. A man who had clearly, indisputably been dead is now on his feet out of the tomb. How do we explain that? Well, Jesus told us who he is, right? I am the resurrection and the life. Who is it that can speak and create life where there was nothing? God. Very first chapter of the Bible. God can speak and create life. Let there be plants. Let there be living creatures. Let there be fish of the sea and birds of the air. Let us make man in our image. God breathes into him the breath of life. God can create life where there is none. And because Jesus is God in the flesh, he can speak and a living man can walk out of a tomb where he'd been dead just moments before. If that was only about Lazarus. Jesus wouldn't have talked about wanting people to believe so much in this story. If it was only about Lazarus, he wouldn't have said, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. This story is not just about Lazarus. It foreshadows Jesus' own resurrection. But more than that, it points to the reality of our resurrection. Jesus had said earlier in John chapter 5, he was uh, teaching about who he was. And he said, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. In other words, one day we're all going to be Lazarus. Everyone in a tomb, anywhere, wherever you're buried, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to say, it's time to come out and we're all going to come out and those who have believed and follow Jesus are going to be raised to live with Him forever. And those who refused to listen to Jesus are still going to awake to His voice, but are going to suffer the consequences of not having believed Him when they had the chance. That's what Jesus is teaching us. That's what Jesus is showing us. He's letting us see, and through this story, allowing us Also to feel with Mary and Martha that sometimes we don't understand why God lets certain things happen. But we do know that he has a plan. And unlike Mary and Martha, we know what the plan is. Because God has told us. In Revelation 21, we read these words. John said, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have, have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all 
things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. We have, may have moments where we say, God, where are you? God, where were you? God, why didn't you? But one day, he will say, I'm here now. I was there then too, though it didn't feel like it. But I'm here now, and I had a purpose, and I had a plan, and you may not understand it, but all that is behind us now. You are with me, I am with you. There is no more death, mourning, crying, pain. All that's gone. Everything's new. My plan is now fulfilled, and you have entered into the joy of your master. Let's pray.